On this week's Motor Week, Richard Hammond gets to grip with Ford's new off-roader, the Maverick, and Rob Halland tests he and I Santa Fe head-on with the Land Rover Freelander. But first, here's Richard Hammond with a look at the latest estate car from Mercedes. Style. Something often linked with cars, sporty, fashionable cars, but not often associated with estate cars. Until now, because now we seem to have the stylish estate car, things like the Alfa Romeo Sport Wagon, and this one from Mercedes. Lifestyle estate, another lifestyle estate. What lifestyle? What if your lifestyle involves sitting in front of the telly a lot, eating chips, not going anywhere, or carrying really, really huge stuff around? Then it's not going to be any use to you, is it? I kind of think I know what they mean. I think they're talking about those people who drive up and down the motorway with surfboards and skis and canoes strapped at the top of their car. Personally, I think the best thing for all of them would be to be made to strap their surfboards onto a skateboard and pump that at the M6, but Never mind. Mercedes claim that their new C-Class is finding brand new Merc customers all over the country, and a lot of them young, which is exactly what they want to achieve with the car. And it certainly does look younger, brighter and fresher than any other Merc. It's available with six engines, amongst which are two diesels, one of which has five cylinders and delivers 170 brake. Anyway, this is a 3.2 litre V6 petrol version, which is even more powerful and even more fun, obviously. Both the C-Class Estate and its lovely little sister, the Sport Coupe, were not simply rehashed versions of the C-Class Saloon upon which they are based. They were both designed at the same time as the Saloon, and so can claim to be cars in their own right, which does shine through in the very finished design. It may be sporty and lifestyle, but it is still a Mercedes, so it is still quite poor. You do want to get a fair bit of kit for your money. And they're not as tight as they used to be. You get automatic climate control, snazzy leather trim on the steering wheel, this nice aluminium effect on the dashboard. You can start uh, adding the odd bit on, obviously, and it can start getting a bit expensive if you want to put leather into it, if you want to go for fully electric seats. But then, it is a prestige motor. After all, nobody ever sang, oh lord, won't you buy me a Peridua nipper? Hmm, I think there's probably a very good reason for that. Now, so far, we have majored on the performance and the looks of the thing, but it is still a practical estate car, and it does still have a big boot, though not the biggest. And more importantly, things like this flat load lip, so you can get in very easily. When these are folded down, you have a completely flat load space. It's got a very nifty and sturdy-looking luggage cover for once, and best of all, a stylish shopping crate. Now no, I've really arrived. Mercedes are currently expending huge amounts of energy in desperately trying to shed their rather fuddy-duddy image and appeal to a younger buyer. And with their ever-expanding range and the arrival of the new C-Class, they're doing a very good job of it. No doubt about it, people want to buy these sporty, lifestyle little estates. This one starts from, what, 22,000 and rises to about 37 for this version with all the bells and whistles on, which isn't too bad. You have got to consider, though, that the Alfa Romeo Sport Wagon starts for thousands less than the cheapest version of this, but then this is still a Mercedes and still feels, drives and looks like a Mercedes. Now, not too long ago, the only positive feature about buying a Korean car was the price tag. 
But in more recent years, all that's changed. Indeed, Hyundai's own coupe has gone down an absolute storm in this country, and they hope to continue that success with this, the new Santa Fe. The Santa Fe marks Hyundai's attack on the popular sports utility vehicle market, putting it head to head with the likes of the Land Rover Freelander and Toyota's RAV4. And what else could we compare Hyundai's new Santa Fe with but Europe's best-selling small off-roader, the Land Rover Freelander? Looks play an important part in this sector, owners are usually more concerned with looks than outright off-road ability. The sales of this car suggests that in the looks department, Land Rover must be doing it right with the Freelander. Despite criticism at launch that the front end looked like a boat, revisions to the car last year were limited to a redesigned front bumper, clear front indicator lenses and an enlarged lower air intake. The Santa Fe was designed by Hyundai's Los Angeles design facility. Hyundai claimed this was to ensure the car is suitable for Western markets. From the back, the car looks very butcher match or the perfect thing for off-roading, but as you move down the side into the front, you get a mishmash of curves, supposedly to echo the coupe. However, if like me, you're no fan of the coupe's looks, you might be a bit disappointed, but it does kind of grow on you after a few days. Now, due to the recent problems in the countryside, we're not able to test either of these two vehicles off-road, but as it's highly unlikely that either of them are going to see sight and sound of a field in a lifetime, what's more important is how they go on-road. Well, Hyundai don't actually make any great claims about the off-road ability of the Santa Fe, and that's because it's an SUV or sports utility vehicle, and that means it's designed more for use on-road or tracks and fields rather than out-and-out -out rocky mountain tracks. Now, this model's powered by a 2.7-litre V6, producing 177 brake horsepower, and that pushes the big Korean to 60 miles an hour in a little over 11 seconds, and you get a top speed of 113 miles an hour. And the fuel consumption's not bad either, just over 25 miles to the gallon. There's full-time four-wheel drive and a four-speed automatic gearbox designed by Porsche nonetheless, and that makes for a very stable and firm ride. Cracks and potholes in the road make no difference to the Santa Fe, and that V6 engine is very quiet and again, super smooth. In fact, it's more like driving a big saloon car. Now, saloon car drivers will notice a little bit more body roll when you drive one of these vehicles, but it's nothing too alarming, and even on some of the sharper corners, you never feel that the car is gonna lose its composure or you're gonna end up in the field. Now, even though Hyundai are pitching the Santa Fe to compete with the likes of the RAV4 and the Freelander, its size puts it more in between the Freelander and the Discovery, so straight away it's got an advantage on its competitors. It really is very spacious in here and there's enough room to sit five adults very comfortably and the boot is absolutely enormous. Now on this V6 Santa Fe, leather seats come as standard and although there's no options list as such, the amount of specification that you do get on the standard car is quite impressive. There's air conditioning, CD player, driver passenger airbags and electric mirrors, windows and sunroof. But where the Santa Fe is let down is with the interior. The plastics and switch gear are pretty ugly and it's certainly not as high quality as many of its rivals. Now whilst it might not have the size of the Santa Fe, this five-door Freelander is still very roomy and there's bags of space in the back for your luggage. Now the specification on this ES model is pretty similar to the Hyundai in that you get leather seats, air conditioning, CD player, driver passenger airbags and electric mirrors, windows and sunroof. Now the interior on the early Freelanders was a little bit suspect, very plasticky, but the revisions made last year have gone some way to improving that. It all feels that little bit more refined now, better put together and the materials feel quite solid and quite expensive. Not too keen on the colour scheme but something like that you could live with. We know the Freelander performs extremely well off-road, in fact it's the leader in its class. Now this particular one I'm driving today, like the Santa Fe, it's got a V6, only this time 2.5 litres and it's taken straight from the Rover 75. And it gives the car a whole new sense of urgency. 0 to 60 takes just 10 seconds and your top speed, again 113 miles an hour. For that engine package, you do really have to push it hard to get the performance. And of course, your fuel consumption is going to suffer and it brings it down to about 23 miles to the gallon. For a car that handles as well as the Freelander off-road, you'd expect there'd be some compromise when it comes to on-road. Well, it's clear the Land Rover boys have been working very, very hard and this car feels absolutely superb. Very stable, very safe and very composed. And you'd be surprised on some of these bends when your instinct is to lift off, you keep your power on and you just whiz around them, no problems. Another area that's really surprised me on the Freelander is the amount of cabin space. It's extremely roomy and if you got in blindfolded, well, you'd swear you were driving a Discovery. Starting at £15,999 for the 2.4 litre petrol to £18,000 for this 2.7 litre V6, 
Hyundai's new Santa Fe represents excellent value for money. Throw in a three-year unlimited mileage warranty and three years RAC assistance, and it's hard to see why the Santa Fe wouldn't make sense. Diesel lovers should hold their breath as later in the year there'll be a two-litre common rail diesel model of the car. There are three different body styles available for the Freelander, hardback, softback three-door models and this, the five-door. And you get a choice of three engines at the moment, a 1.8 petrol, a two-litre diesel and the one we've been driving today, a two-and-a-half-litre V6. For the basic 1.8 petrol three door, and they go right up to 24,595 for a fully equipped two and a half litre V6. Now, there's no doubt that over the past decade, Hyundai have come on a heck of a long way, and this Santa Fe is the best car that they've ever launched in this country. Now, whether you like the looks or not, it certainly performs very well and it brings genuine value for money to the SUV market. But where it's going to lose sales to the Freelander is on the badge. But if you can put badge snobber behind you and going off road is in your main criteria, well, you could save yourself four grand and do a lot worse than a Santa Fe. After the break, we get Richard Hammond's view of the new Ford Maverick. So, we're here. We have to be careful here and here. And with a bit of luck, we should make it through here and end up here. To recap, this then is our house. That's the end of our road. We turn right past the roundabout where the shops are. There's the school. Drop the kids off. We should make it back. Mission accomplished. So obviously, we're going to need a 4 before. Well, that's what everybody else uses to tackle the urban commute, isn't it? And our chosen steed is this, the all-new Ford Maverick. Whilst the previous Maverick was nothing more than a spot of badge engineering on a Nissan Tirano, this new one is just that, all new, and it's made entirely from Ford jeans. It's a competitor in the lightweight SUV sports utility vehicle market. In other words, a competitor for the likes of the RAV4, the CRV, and Ford's arch enemy, the Vauxhall Frontera. Every time a new 4x4 is launched, whoever makes it, the manufacturer will say, oh, it drives just like a car. Well, it doesn't. They never do. It's a 4x4. It's tall. It's got longer suspension. It's got huge unsprung weight with the extra transmission. But, in the case of the Maverick, it's not far off. It's not at all bad. Big wobbly monster, it isn't. The most direct comparison is going to be with the Vauxhall Frontera. You can feel it shudder when I mention it. So they've got to answer to the impressive Frontera V6, and they have with this 3-litre V6. It's basically a bored out and enlarged version of the 2.5-litre Duratec familiar to Mondeo owners. There is a 2-litre option as well. This one will dash from 0 to 60 in about 10 and a half seconds and onto a top speed of 118. Not much, but it's actually quite respectable for a car in this sector. Checking out a new car that claims to be good both on and off-road and only driving it on the road would be a bit like having a Swiss Army penknife and only using the blade and not the scissors. So we've got to have a go, we just need a bit of mud. Alright, so it's hardly crossing the Andes, but this is about as rough as it's likely to get for one of these cars. Maybe romping across a field to find the best picnic spot. So this is probably a fair enough test. It's hardly a mud plugger's dream, but it's got the basics to get you out of trouble. Ordinarily on the road, the drive is delivered to the front wheels. But if you are getting off-road and you detect a bit of slippage, power will be transferred to the rear. Alternately, you can do it yourself manually by switching to permanent 4x4. As soon as you get off-road, things like rather vague steering no longer matter. There are a couple of problems, though. The throttle on this particular one is incredibly sensitive, so it wouldn't be too difficult to get into a bit of a kangarooing situation. It does suffer, though, from something I've noticed in one or two SUVs recently. They claim to be off-road capable-ish, and yet they've got absolutely no steering lock, which is useless if you want to change direction in a, a nasty, cramped bit of woodland or maybe at the top of a bendy, twisty track. Not a good point in an off-roader. The very fact that this car is compromised means it's never going to be a star or anything, but if you want something that can romp across a field happily and get you to that best picnic spot before anybody else without the wheels falling off, yeah, it'll do the job. Of course, when you do finally pull up at the perfect picnic spot, the last thing you want to do as you stretch out in your blanket is look across at a real moose of a car. And Ford haven't done a bad job here. It's not the most striking of cars, but it's not ugly either. There is something spookily Freelanderish about the front end, though, and along the flanks. Odd, really, that they should copy a car made by a company that they also own. When you get to the rear, there's something slightly Jeep Cherokee-ish about it. 
A large part of an SUV's job is to be a fashion statement. It's got to look like it could take Davy Crockett hunting caribou in Alaska, but all you're actually going to do is cruise the high street. Despite what the manufacturers might say, these things are not really about romping down to the lake with your jet skis on the back and your mountain bikes on the roof. They're about going to the shops, dropping the kids off at school. Day-to-day, -day, ordinary, boring stuff that somehow a car with this extra space around you makes that a bit easier and a bit more pleasurable. And that's what it's about. It's boring, but it's true. If you fancy one, you won't have to be a millionaire to buy one because for the two litre you'll pay about 17 grand and for the three litre you'll pay about 20 grand. They may not be the most exciting vehicle on the road, but whether you're going on or off road, they'll do the job. An English country home, the perfect setting for two traditionally English machines, a soft top sports car and a Range Rover style 4x4. The sports car was so wonderfully British that they even built it for James Bond. And the 4x4 came straight out of the expert's Land Rover stable. Only trouble is, they're not British at all, because both the Z8 and the X5 are German. They're from the men from Munich, BMW who have this rather strange obsession with all things British. Who could forget the failed marriage with Rover? And now they're building the all-new Mini. But the one thing that BMW do very well is they build stonking machines. And when you put that badge on the front, you're guaranteed big success, which is why both the Z8 and the X5 have sold out their first six months supply for Britain. Anyway, that's enough talking. Let's go and try the X5 first and see how much the men from BMW have learnt from the men from Land Rover. Cheeky those Germans as well. They tried to pretend that they were pioneering something new with the X5 and called it the world's first sport activity vehicle. Forget all that. It's a posh 4x4. And they've taken the very best that Land Rover can offer them and then added their own extra dimension. And that is the engine and the on-road handling. This is like no other 4x4. 4.4 litre engine V8 0 to 62 in 7.5 seconds, top of nearly 130 miles an hour. That's express saloon car work, and that's exactly what this is, because that is the big difference between the X5 and just about anything else on the road. It handles like a saloon car, but it's a 4x4. It's called having the best of all worlds. The interior really is classic BMW with that little bit extra. The X5 has got a real top drawer feel to everything you touch and it somehow feels just that bit more substantial and that little bit different to the normal 5 series and 7 series. You get an awful lot of enjoyment out of this car which is something you don't normally associate with 4x4s. They're big, they're solid, they look imposing but they're normally a pain to drive. This is definitely not a pain to drive. It's got definite X credentials. This is the first time I've actually road tested a 4x4 and not gone off road. That's because the majority of owners of the X5 will never venture anywhere more demanding than a twisty country road. That said, I did take it off road in America and it's perfectly adequate. As for the normal situation that you would think of with 4x4s of being a little bit basic, forget that as well. Inside here, you've got limo style luxuries. You've got all the gadgets you can imagine, navigational system, best CD player you can find, leather seats, nice touches of aluminium all around the dash. It is a thoroughly pleasant place to travel in. And that's not only from a sitting and comfort point of view, but also from a point of view of just enjoying yourself when you're driving hard. And the price? 
44,670, which is Range Rover territory, but then the X5 is very definitely a worthy rival. You've got to hand it to them. They're clever, these Germans, very clever. They would appear to have learned an awful lot from Land Rover and then added their own touch of driving excellence. This really is a formidable machine. But I've had enough of being the landed gentry. I think it's time for a rather large change of character. Time for me to become Mr. James Bond. I think this looks more the part. Now, let's go and see why old James got so excited about this black beast. If you thought the Batmobile exterior was impressive, take a look at this. Clever little thing here, they have all of the dials slightly to your right, beautiful for the eye line here, in a sort of motorcycle style cowling, and in front of you you've got no distractions. The Z8 will set you back a hefty £80,000 and that's an awful lot of dough, but you do become a member of a rather exclusive club, because BMW intends selling just 60 in the UK next year. And of course underneath the bonnet is where it's all really happening. There we have a 5-litre V8 engine with which James Bond can leave his passengers decidedly shaken and stirred, especially when you actually switch the sport mode button, which really gives you lift-off. And that engine gives you supercar performance. We're talking 0 to 62 mile an hour in 4.7 seconds and on to a limited top speed of 155. That's fast enough for even James to get away from all those baddies. Be sure to watch next week's Moto Week when we'll be testing the all-new Renault Laguna V6.